Is Thailand new crypto hub? How has the crypto boom influenced enterprise blockchains? And why you should keep an eye on CBDC developments in Asia Pacific. Welcome to Word on the Block, the series that takes a deeper dive into blockchain and the emerging technologies that shape our world at the intersection of business, politics, and economy. It's what we cover right here on Forecast News. I'm Forecast Editor-in-Chief Angie Lau. Movies and travel, well, you can pay for them with crypto in Thailand now, as the nation leans on blockchain technology for much needed push into the post-COVID world. Enterprise blockchain firm R3 has established an office in Thailand, and maybe that they're not necessarily just there for the full moon party. Recently renewing their partnership with Bangkok Bank, R3's Corda is digitizing Thailand's economy. Well, let's find out more. Let's bring in R3, head of Asia Pacific, Amit Ghosh, to find out how they're doing it. Amit, welcome to the show. Uh, good morning, Angie, and great to be here. I want to understand, as you know, as we're all super interested, Thailand is is you know one of the most you know beautiful, pristine geographies. Uh, but a very promising economy. It's not quite there yet. It's still a developing nation. And, and we have certainly observed from a global level the role that Thailand wants to play. And so with crypto, what does it hope to play in the next five to 10 years or even earlier than that? Look, I think we have been pleasantly surprised uh, and uh, have a, had a positive interaction with the ecosystem in Thailand, right? Uh, I think ever since we started as a company in 2015, we have had uh, partners and customers in Thailand, and we see that you know uh, it's it's an economy. While at the economy level, it it is it hasn't risen yet uh, to the heights which it wants to reach, as you just said. Uh, on the blockchain side and the crypto side, I, I believe they are they are a leading player uh, globally. Uh, they don't probably get as much recognition for all the work that's happening in the ecosystem there. But uh, from our experience, they are one of our leading countries uh, globally, in fact. Uh, so, uh, you know, from a R3 perspective, R3 Corda is an enterprise blockchain platform. We build uh, applications uh, with our partners uh, using our Corda enterprise platform. And those applications range from various industries in uh, CBDC, trade finance, supply chain, insurance and others. So in Thailand, we have been very, very busy over the last couple of years, uh, and the Bangkok Bank uh, announcement is another testament of our work there. Uh, in working along those areas, so with Bangkok Bank, for example, we are working on various trade finance applications. One of them has been is a Singapore-based company, but very active uh, in Thailand. Uh, they are using Corda to build and digitize letter of credit applications, and Bangkok Bank is one of their key customers. Uh, so that's companies called Contour. You might have heard of it. Uh, they are expanding quite rapidly in the region as well. They recently signed up ICBC, for example, in China as well as a customer. So, so there, there are examples like that. Uh, and then Bangkok Bank and similarly customers in Thailand are also building their own applications for pain points which they have, right? Uh, so they, in, in one of the cases, uh, Bangkok Bank will be digitizing a lot of their processes with their anchor customers and supplier base. So we are working with Bangkok Bank, for example, on those. And those are just a few examples. We have had a long history of working with Bank of Thailand, exam for example, on the CBDC side, which you are aware of the project in Thanon. And uh, more to come, really. Uh, so very excited about what we are doing in Thailand, very excited about what we are doing in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, as you mentioned, you just renewed your partnership with Bangkok Bank. Uh, you're setting up a team, establishing a local office, and it really sounds like um, you've become uh, a trusted partner mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of enterprise and institutions in Thailand. Uh, it does beg the question of interoperability. How are you also thinking about, as you're establishing that technology layer for Thailand, how it's going to also integrate uh, and and speak to you know other other technology uh, infrastructure layers uh, that might be different than R three, different uh, than Thailand's uh, as it extends its partnership in blockchain across the region. Uh, so great question, uh, and I'll answer that in three parts effectively. So there is interoperability of various business applications. And I think today, uh, when we started off Corda and building Corda, we realized that 
you know, companies will use business, different business applications which are built on Corda. So you might have a trade finance application built on Corda, and then you might have a supply chain application built on Corda, and you might have an insurance application built on Corda. We architected Corda uh, and built a Corda network effectively where these applications can really interoperate very seamlessly. So that's that's our approach to interoperability within our ecosystem, right? I think uh, from the get-go, we knew that we'll have to interoperate with current technology or legacy technology, as you might call it, right? So whether it's the large ERP providers like SAP or whether it be other platforms, I think we, we knew that we have to coexist here, right? It's not about entirely displacement of existing technology. And also on the infrastructure layer, you know, we have to work with the cloud providers. We have to work with the uh, on-prem server providers, right? So whether it's be AWS or IBM or Microsoft or GCP, I think we, we work with all of them. So the way we have architected Corda and uh, the design choices we made uh, enabled us to interoperate with existing technology quite seamlessly as well. And we have also forged a deep partnerships with these companies to make it easy for customers who are, uh, let's say, for example, using an IBM Linux One server uh, and also want to use Corda. Now Corda is today, uh, and this is something we announced late last year, Corda is integrated off the shelf on, on the Linux One server line, right? So, so we are working with all these infrastructure providers to make it easy for our customers like Bangkok Bank to really use Corda. And finally, I think the uh, the most interesting maybe question for the ecosystem is interoperability between different blockchains uh, and different mm-hmm. and even permission blockchains like ours with public blockchains. Frankly speaking, I think that conversation is um, definitely happening, but the need from customers hasn't come to us yet. Uh, we'll tackle that when it does, right? Uh, so there are very few cases where I can think of where a network of institutions who are building an application in Corda also want to do something similarly on Hyperledger or Ethereum or something like that. So that that's not yet happening. Uh, but as you rightly can predict, you know, it, it's a matter of time because, you know, uh, it will happen. So we'll tackle it when we get to it. Uh, I think we are quite busy working with our customers right now uh, and our partners to make it easy for them to use Corda and build uh, applications which solve their problems. Yeah, no doubt that day is coming. Uh, I, I also note that, you know, as a former executive at, at Visa and PayPal, uh, you know, and these are two uh, large global conglomerates that are freshly into the crypto and blockchain space. Does that surprise you? Not at all. Uh, having having been there, uh, I know that both of them have uh, aspirations to be the payment rails and the payment network technology provider for the globe, uh, for both merchants, consumers, companies. And I am absolutely not surprised that they have jumped in. I'm sure they have been working on it for a few years now and they've made the announcements only recently. Uh, I think they will continue to uh, delve more into how to enable uh, cryptocurrencies especially, or even you know uh, CBDCs in the future uh, to transverse on their rails. Uh, so they have a huge powerful network where they connect consumers and merchants I can use a Visa card to buy coffee or I can go online and shop using my PayPal account. Why can't I just uh, pay with a, you know, a digital yuan or a digital dollar or, or a Bitcoin or anything else, right? So I think they are making these choices because consumers want these choices. Uh, so yeah. I'm, I'm not at all surprised. And merchants are getting also open to accepting these payment methods, right? So that's also important. Yeah. Well, and, and to your point that Thailand really seems to be the the testing ground, not necessarily that they're testing it, they're full on. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're working with R3, obviously. But I think to everybody else observing, you know, what's happening in Thailand, what's happening in Asia, what's happening in, in specific sandbox jurisdictions is really interesting because we can see then how does it adapt to a consumer group, a, a certain demographic, certain enterprise transaction, a, a certain, you know, uh, a, a financial vehicle, um, and, and then across industries. To your point, if Visa and PayPal are coming in and allowing people to uh, use crypto, Thailand's crypto adoption is also increasing. Uh, the, uh, we recently heard of a, and reported on a major movie theater in Thailand starting to uh, receive Bitcoin as payment. This is this is a pilot. Um, we also saw 
uh, essentially the uh, national policy um, that took a look at, uh, you know, whether or not there should be a minimum annual income for crypto investors, um, you know, that that is is to test public sentiment. Then we have the tourism board uh, starting to target crypto holders in Japan to lure them mm-hmm. to, to come to to Thailand and explore. As you're working across industries, what do you think is the most interesting observation that you're you're viewing these these nascent pilots and these you know these outreach attempts uh, using crypto um, and and if it's effective so far what 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 are you seeing that's interesting that you can report even in its early days for Thailand? Yeah, look, I think Thailand, as I said, uh, always continues to lead innovation, especially in Southeast Asia, along with, I think, Singapore as the other economy which does that. Um, From a crypto perspective, I I think from our perspective, we, as you know, we are a platform which doesn't have a native crypto built in, right? So we we are not directly in the the game, so to say, but where we come in and where we participate in these uh, ecosystem plays or, you know, these use cases which are coming in is to provide the backend infrastructure and really the platform where applications will get built, you know, uh, you know, whether you want to spend Bitcoin or whether you want to spend Ethereum or something else, right, uh, to buy a movie ticket or buy a cup of coffee uh, in the future. I think the national levels payment systems will require to be resilient, will require to be scalable, will require uh, a lot of different features which we have catered for. So from our perspective, I think we are clearly and very uh, interestingly observing the DeFi space uh, overall, Mm -hmm. which is, I think, the examples you quoted are a part of that. Uh, They're much more going on, as as you know, uh, very well. And we are are, uh, working with the customers and partners to participate, uh, leveraging our strengths, right? So, for example, one one of the things which we are observing is a very deep interest from both institutional and other investors to really participate in the crypto uh, and digital asset space. So what we did, for example, there is work with HSBC, which is one of the biggest custodians of assets uh, to build a digital vault. uh, And that's using uh, Corda Enterprise. And that really serves the institutional investors who are interested in this space. so that's that's our role in the uh, in the DeFi space today. Of course, you know we are we are constantly evolving our product line, so there's more to come, and uh, we hope to uh, be more ingrained there as well. Uh, but we are already thought, quite participating quite heavily. I, I've often talked about how DeFi is uh, is en- enormously interesting because of the the lessons that it can give uh, centralized finance or mm-hmm. CFI or, or, or mainstream institutions. Uh, like HSBC and other banks of the world, um, what what are the most interesting aspects of DeFi that you think has, uh, from an R three perspective, product level interest, uh, enterprise interest? So definitely, I think you know uh, how do you issue assets and manage those assets and hold those assets. I think if you're an in- institutional investor, you are dealing in billions and millions of assets, right? Or you know. Uh, values worth there. So you want to make sure that things are safe. Uh, I think the ecosystem, which is, if, if you think of um, DeFi assets transversing different platforms, like you have an asset on Bitcoin, which is uh, on the Bitcoin network and sitting in exchanges, potentially or in your ledger wallets, uh, hardware wallets, versus you, know, you have institutional investors holding these assets, uh, different assets which they procure. I think, how do you, how do you trade them? How do you hold them? How do you sell them? Uh, I think those are the areas where we play in. And then uh, we would see new use cases coming up in lending, for example, right? Uh, we are already getting, like there are companies like BrockFi who are already paying interest uh, on your crypto assets, right? Uh, and we, we want to work with them as well uh, to provide the infrastructure which they need uh, to build their technology mm-hmm. stack. Of course, the asset in itself is a Bitcoin asset potentially, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but you know, uh, how do you again store it, manage it, issue it, trade it? Uh, those are the problems which we are interested to solve. And and these are these are things that that you know you can explore definitely in Thailand. There seems to be mm-hmm. just such an interesting direction of crypto in Thailand. How do you compare that 
to other regions in the Asia Pacific? I think there are at least a few other geographies in Asia Pacific where there is a huge interest in crypto. You know, Korea comes to mind naturally. To an extent, Japan comes to mind. Uh, China, of course, uh, Hong Kong. Uh, but you know, like I think adoption is also dependent a little bit on you know the regulations uh, in in these cases. And uh, from an R3 perspective, we also see regulations as a big part of blockchain adoption. So you know, the, the mere reason we started off our journey as a company working very heavily with regulators was to inform them on what this technology can bring, what is blockchain really, and why this is necessary to upgrade the infrastructure of the country, whether it be crypto or non-crypto use cases, right? Uh, so we see some progressive regulators. We see some reactionary moves from regulators, as you can see in the region, especially, you know, uh, you have seen bans in a few different countries and then bans being lifted and then bans being put again. Uh, on, Thailand on, is a great example. Right. Right. Uh, right. So exa- exactly. So uh, I think the way we look at this whole ecosystem and our role in the ecosystem is to drive the right conversation with the regulators from the very beginning rather than when things happen, like we yeah. don't want to be reactionary to this. We want to be proactive here. So we have well, great- Well, then help, the- help, help us understand then uh, Thailand's stance on, uh, you know, uh, the stable coins tied to bot. Um, and and there's, a, you know, they're very clear uh, at the moment, at mm-hmm. least, that they don't like it. They do not want a stable coin that is pegged to the Thai bot. They're okay with US dollar. Uh, clearly, they're working on CBDC. But I, I, I wonder, I, I wonder why that stance and what are the concerns? Look, uh, it's, uh, this is uh, this is a hard question in some sense because I, I don't know what exactly Bank of Thailand and the other regulators are thinking. But our view is that given how much work Bank of Thailand has done uh, itself, I think they will need, they will lead the innovation rather than being uh, you know subject to uh, innovation which which doesn't uh, work for them right so I, we we have seen enough examples of you know bank of thailand working on various different initiatives in the cbdc space so uh, both on the wholesale side and recently on the retail side as well so i i expect that you know bank of thailand wants to manage this carefully uh, wants to also protect its uh, uh, citizens right uh, i think there's a fiduciary responsibility of the government to protect the citizens and we have seen enough scams happening in the crypto space right and uh, so i think uh, my my understanding and my uh, assumption here is that uh, thailand because it's a progressive regulator because it's a progressive economy it's very innovation prone i think they will continue to just drive the innovation rather than being subject to it and then you know uh, putting their citizens in harm in some sense, right? Uh, because mo- most people don't still understand what a stable coin is. Most people don't understand why crypto prices are moving so much up or down, right? So I think it's it's hard if you're a pure retail investor. It's hard even for educated individuals like myself sometimes to understand what's going on because there's so much going on, right? Yes. And so, some of it is just gamed, as we know, right? Uh, as well, like there's large players who are probably making big swings in these cases, and that's yeah. moving the markets, right? So, uh, so I think my view is Bank of Thailand, uh, as always, uh, will lead innovation, and that's why probably, uh, but I'm guessing a little bit here, as you can imagine. You know, when we take a, a look across the landscape, um, you're you're totally right. I mean, Thailand, I think, would be, uh, you know, probably. Um, superficially considered in probably uh, tier two Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to just regulatory and adoption. Most of the attention is still on Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, uh, Korea to a certain extent. Um, But Korea and and Thailand probably, you know, kind of sit sit in that, that second tier. But that doesn't mean that there aren't some really interesting innovations that are happening in Thailand, Korea, we've noted. Um, But since you're there, since there's just such, you know, in, you know, uh, not even a high level view, you're you're in the the weeds with with the Thailand's innovation. Um, Are there interesting things that they got on the regulatory uh, part of it on on policy that have stoked? a very interesting growth pattern 
in either industry or engagement or adoption, anything that you could share that might be very interesting from a global point of view that, hey, that worked really well in Thailand. We should pay attention. And what would that be? Yeah, so quite a few things. I think uh, definitely their work on the CBDC side. I think they were one of the early uh, central banks globally to lead that. Uh, and that's very well known. Uh, maybe a less well-known example is uh, how they work with the industry really very closely. So, for example, you know, we we work very closely with Siam Commercial Bank's uh, innovation team called Digital Ventures to build a product uh, called B2P, which is uh, a procure-to-pay product in which digitizes you know the processes between the bank and their primary customer at that point, uh, Siam Cement Group, and and the supplier base. So, you know, uh, that's, that, that started the journey. That platform right now has 70 other corporates similar to Siam Cement Group. So, you know, all the big corporates on the platform, over 7,000 suppliers on the platform. And, you know, Bank of Thailand has been very keenly and closely observing what goes on in this industry and has an intention to take this broader than just one bank, right? Because they feel that, you know, this digitizing, digitization effort will really help the overall industry, right? So what I find very fascinating and really good about most central banks, especially also Bank of Thailand, uh, is that they work very closely with the industry and not limited to banks only sometimes, right? They, they understand what's going on in this ecosystem. They leverage their strengths, you know, uh, companies like ITMX, which is the payment switch uh, and the payments rails for domestic payments in uh, Thailand, uh, the Thai Banking Association, you know, other associations in Thailand, all are very well ingrained and speaking mm. to each other. So I think that's what's fascinating and that's what's drive the innovation, not just within one central bank or one corporate or one bank. I think it, it drives the whole ecosystem to do more, right? Uh, and I find that approach quite a good one. We see a few other countries taking that approach, but many, many do this in silos, right? Uh, and that's where yeah. innovation is just not... Uh, the tide doesn't rise for everybody at the same time, right? Yeah, and, and certainly at Forecast, we've noted exactly where those spots are. Um, you know, with Thailand also, I think there's just some interesting, you know, even B to C uh, engagement, you know, thinking about the consumer, thinking about the end user, and then trying to stoke interest uh, with crypto. And I wonder, you know, what... What observations there? Is it is it working? Is it exciting? Is it froth? Uh, you know, I note that Thailand walked back. You know, that minimum uh, 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 personal wealth uh, requirement before you could be a retail um, investor in in crypto um, because they wanted to test public sentiment. Mm -hmm. What is the public sentiment exactly? Uh, our view is definitely within the educated masses, there is a huge degree of awareness uh, just broadly uh, of the technology and of also cryptocurrencies. So uh, I think, you know, I find Thai people very entrepreneurial and I think they, they, they will jump into the game uh, many times uh, to participate. So I, I feel that that's, that's also driving the interest within the public. Uh, I think, you know, we are not quite ready, uh, in my view, for for the entire country to be open to adopting uh, these crypto. As I said, you know, like I think it, it requires some degree of understanding uh, before you invest. Like it's not yet uh, similar to buying a share of, let's say, R3 or Visa or PayPal or whatever company, right? I think it's not as, uh, the markets are not stable yet right as we can clearly see so i think the average investor uh should be protected uh but of course the you know the opportunistic investor the entrepreneurial investor the one which takes the effort i think there's uh, the sentiment there is that look we should be participating here and that's what i think uh the bank of thailand and other regulatory authorities are trying to balance right that interest on one side but also the need yeah. to protect the citizens and so, so in contrast to efforts in the CBDC, if we're going to see, uh, you know, a digital bot, uh, which is Thailand's fiat currency, um, and we're going to see the CBDC or the digital bot rolled out to its citizens, mm -hmm. how does that, does that conflict 
with uh, cryptocurrency holdings, trading. How, what is the intersection of that like? Is it is is it a conflict? Is it or is it more complementary? It's not a conflict. I think the digital VAT uh, is a representation of your, of the VAT we hold in our wallets or in our bank accounts. But it's more programmable, right? I think uh, the the difference. It's not that money is not digital enough today. Like you know, we have bank accounts that's entirely digital. I can move money to you. It's all digital, right? Uh, but I think it's not programmable. So I think uh, digital bath will give the programmability. I think it, it will it will remain similar to cash being an asset. Uh, it will it will be an asset class. Uh, so will Bitcoin be an asset class? Uh, but I think the digital bath really adds uh, another layer and another effort to digitize money movement and money in the economy, right? Uh, especially in Thailand, if you go, as we have all been to the nice tourist spots, a lot of uh, our interaction is still on paper-based cash, right? And I think all economies around the globe uh, are at some stage of uh, digitizing this cash because I think cash has a lot of demerits, right? It, it needs management, it leads to fraud, it leads to corruption and so on. So I think the digital path, in my view, is not a conflict to whatever a retail investor or an institutional investor does with other asset classes in the crypto space or other digital asset classes, right? You could, like the area where we are working in, which is related, but uh, not crypto, is digitization of assets, uh, which are like real estate or, or invoices, right? And how do you, those are digital representations, representations of assets as well. And uh, both retail and institutional investors want to participate. So I think you will see all asset yeah. classes remaining uh, and digital bad being a complementary, but more focused on digitization of payments. Look, I think you, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. Uh, you know, essentially, if you want to think about what uh, CBDC is, it's, it's literally programmable money. Mm -hmm. And the people who are doing the programming is the central bank. Uh, and so so for people who are just getting into the space, they might be apprehensive. OK, what does programmable money actually mean? Uh, how, how does programmable money facilitate the current role that C, uh, that central banks play? And so so what is the thinking behind what is going to be programmed into this money? Give me some examples. So a good example is resulting from the pandemic, right, uh, where many uh, governments uh, have issued uh, grants to their citizens under a certain income, right, and allowing those grants to be used for the right purposes, whether it be food, medicines, and so on. Today, you know, if, you, if, if the government gives me $100, there's no ability for them to say, that $100 can only be spent for buying medicines or buying food. I can totally go and gamble it. Right uh, in the casinos, uh, although the casino charges here in Singapore are extraordinarily high to enter, uh, but nevertheless, right? I think the point being that you know programmable money allows you to just program the conditions where the money can be used and how the money can be tracked and how the money can be monitored. Uh, so it's it's one the usage of money. It's second, you know, in economies where there is high corruption, it is the traceability of money as well. Right, uh, how that money exchanges hands. Cash is very hard to trace. Uh, like you, you have heard enough cases in enough economies in Asia where you know people find enough cash uh, in, in pillows and you know <laughs> in mattresses and so on, right? Uh, and that's very hard to trace. Whereas money which is digital only uh, and programmable uh, can be traced, can be determined where to use. Uh, and that usage is not only limited to necessary needs, it's usage for wrong purposes like you can track those and block those like you could you could program a money and say look this this digital bath or this digital dollar cannot be used to buy drugs for example right uh, so that's where programmable uh, features come in i think to be frank uh, i would say we are a few years away from full scale deployment of uh, of uh, uh, retail cbdc but I think the leading central banks know that the world, uh, they need this technology. And many of the uh, global central banks are working with us uh, to already start on that journey. But this requires both political will. This requires a new degree of governance. It's not just technology which needs to come together here uh, for retail CBDC. And it, it requires participation from the economy and the people in the economy and the merchants and the consumers, right? 
Absolutely. So it's a big but effort. The, the domestic infrastructure is one. And then you, of course, have the, the external world. infrastructure, right? I mean, Project Inthanon Line Rock is, is uh, it, to that example. Uh, you're working with Thailand on the CBDC. This Project Inthanon Lion Rock that we've reported on uh, at Forecast uh, is talking about the UAE, uh, Thailand, and Hong Kong initiative. So all the CBDCs are now uh, working together. Consensus Quorum uh, joined the project. It is behind some of the CBDC efforts, ex, uh, you know, external to Thailand. Um, and so it, it, it's back to the question of how how do you, as a permissioned blockchain, uh, work with what is essentially a permissionless aspect of of um, you know. CBDC uh, infrastructure. How how are you? How are you? How is this project also evolving? How permissioned and permissionless blockchains work together? Look, I, I think as I said before, it's a matter of time when these will come together. I think today uh, you know, we we work with uh, platforms like Quorum or on any other uh, complementary platform. By either building technology ourselves or or working with partners. So, for example, on the identity side, we work with the Hyperledger project called Sovereign, right? And then therein we have put the effort internally because we know that you know there are benefits of working with Sovereign, uh, uh, for example. However, you know we in 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 cases where we interact with Quorum or any other project, then most likely at this stage we work with our partners uh, who are building the product uh, or the application. We are still the platform company and maybe the application provider is bridging the gap for now. The real interoperability, as I said uh, earlier, probably will come at some point. Uh, again, not there yet. Uh, from our perspective, it's not a high demand from our customers to focus on that. Uh, so we, we, we are trying to make, make our platform as better and as uh, rich for our current customers and our future customers. Uh, but we'll tackle the interoperability question for sure at some point. What stage are we at uh, with uh, APAC adoption? What's I, your perspective? I, I think uh, APAC overall is leading in many areas. Uh, I would say from the central bank perspective, I, I would say APAC's definitely leading uh, globally. Uh, you see that Europe and North America and even parts of Africa or LATAM are, are following what the central banks here are doing. Uh, I, I feel that from a trade perspective also, there's a big um, leading role we are playing. Also because, you know, APAC tends to be uh, an important uh, leg of any trade corridor, right? Whether it be China, whether it be parts of Vietnam or Australia or India. I think we, are, we have enough economies here who are huge parts of uh, trade corridors. And places like Singapore are huge trade hubs, right? So we see a lot of adoption by the local government in Singapore, for example, whether it be uh, the agencies like IMDA or Enterprise Singapore or even the Ministry of Trade, uh, they are adopting blockchain technology. So I think uh, overall, I'm very pleased of where adoption is. I think there is some froth in the market right now uh, from a retail perspective. Uh, because there is some interest in the volatility of the crypto side, uh, but we don't really get involved that much directly, uh, primarily because of our role as a permission blockchain platform for businesses, yeah. which is what we are trying to solve. And where we see opportunity really is, you know, doing new things. Uh, so we have recently launched uh, a product on multi-party confidential computing called Conclave. That's very exciting for any data aggregators, whether those be central agencies or companies who connect with other companies and process data. So that's that's very powerful. We are working with various companies in the region on that. We announced an acquisition, for example, of a, a electronic bills of lading company, which is a very critical document in the trade world. And we are building an S, uh, SDK to make it easy for companies to digitize that document when you know that document be moves between corporates, banks, shippers, and customs. So we're working with governments as well as companies on those and so on, right? So I think, you know, uh, we were, we started our journey with Corda, which was the distributed ledger platform, but we see the opportunity here to do a lot more with our customers because they are telling us what they need R3 to help them with. I think that's, if that's not uh, more of an 
indicator on adoption, uh, I don't know what is. Uh, you've, you've, you know, not only helped expand your setting up office and continuing to see the business case to help enterprises and governments and agencies to get deeper into blockchain. There is a business case for you to Absolutely. expand into Thailand. I think that is uh, the best indicator that that we can realistically see. The froth, let somebody else, you know, I think what that represents to your point is it's it, it's interesting. It has stoked interest, but I think it will also bring more interest to expand into what is the meat and potatoes yep. of, of blockchain growth. And it's not necessarily speculative nature of prices on crypto. It's certainly what are real governments, agencies, and enterprise doing with blockchain. Thank you for sharing. Uh, that was fascinating insight into um, how Thailand is thinking and in, in extending uh, blockchain integration in its own economy. It was great to have you on, Amit. Thank you, and great to be here. Absolutely. And, and I want to thank Amit for joining us, our three head of Asia Pacific there. I'm going to welcome you back. We're going to get more updates uh, when the time warrants. But audience, you've been a great, uh, great viewers. And I want to thank you for joining us on this latest episode of Word on the Block. I'm Angie Lau, Forecast News Editor-in-Chief. Until the next time.